All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, today, the illustrious Samantha King will be giving us a presentation today on a case. And our four um, brave volunteers, Leela, um, Dr. Mandare, Dr. Jankowski, and Dr. Kuntz are going to, um, they're going to be our uh, residents that are actually going to uh, go th we're going to go through the case with, and they're going to be showing us kind of their their clinical reasoning and their judgment and asking the questions. And um, me and Danny, as always, will be facilitating this conversation. And so without further ado, Dr. King, can you uh, go ahead and give us the HPI and uh, just leave out any uh, pertinent like past medical or surgical history um, that might uh, sway the case at this moment? Sure, sounds good. And sorry, there's a camera right in front of me, but I can't get it to work. So like, you can't see my face. <laughs> um, so a 29-year-old guy is coming into the ED with chest pain and headache. The chest pain actually started a few months ago. Um, he developed cough, some fevers, some left-sided chest pain. It's like on his left lateral chest. It's worse when he coughs. Since he was seen at another emergency department for this, they gave him some antibiotics for pneumonia. He never really got better though. Um, and then about two weeks ago, he started to have headaches, which is new for him. They're on the right side of his head and associated with some nausea and photophobia. So his primary care, he thought maybe this was migraines. So he was given Fioracet, um, but it didn't really help. His girlfriend actually brought him in today because she said he's acting strange, a little more confused than normal. Good. Okay, let's stop there. So, um, so just kind of getting this basic history. You got um, uh, our our, uh, our residents that are on and are kind of we're going through the case with. I want to hear from you guys. What do you guys think of? I guess when you hear cough, fevers, left side of chest pain, what does that kind of lead you guys to? Definitely pneumonia, some sort of infection. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Um, and so do you guys, do you have any other like clarifying questions that you guys want to uh, ask right now or anything that um, you uh, uh, need a little bit more details on? Okay. What do you guys think about the, um, oh, sorry. Some yeah, I just, I just didn't hear about, so he's coughing up sputum. How frequently is there blood mixed in this? So it's actually been a dry cough. He was never really coughing up any sputum and no blood. Okay. And duration-wise, it's been going on for a month? Yeah, about about four months now. Dr. Mendoza, why, why do you ask about, um, why do you ask about the uh, hemoptysis? Uh, again, I mean, triggering for a few things. I mean, things that like I, I quickly associate with that, like pneumonias can, um, yeah, clear, like very, um, can be associated with that PEs as well. You think about cancers, you think about atypical things like TB, um, also associated with it. The criticity of this is somewhat, um, like helps you maybe cipher through a few of those relative to others, but that, that's one thing that would be alarming. Yeah, stealing from Dr. Gergen's talk um, last week, this week, um, hemoptysis is like some chronic inflammation or some um, neovascularization or maybe some um, like cavitary lesion, and, um, malignancy, something like that. Cool. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, I think it's, um, it is kind of odd, right? This guy's had a few months of a fever and fever and cough that's a little bit odd um, and I agree like if hemoptysis is a great question because you think about all these like smoldering infection the TB classically will cause hemoptysis and especially it has a process that's called like consumption so it's the whole thing about you kind of these people like have this like slowly like uh, wasting away disease where they're just kind of get more fatigue fevers weight loss um, yeah so good questions good questions so I think I think that's pretty good on the HPA I feel like I've got a lot of good information from there so let's why don't we go into the relevant past medical and surgical history? Sure. So past medical history, he has type 1 diabetes. He's had it since childhood. Um, 
he has an insulin pump and also a continuous glucose monitor. It's like more or less a closed loop system. So he's not actually sure how much insulin he's taking. And he says he's had a couple of seizures before. Um, he was told in the past this was due to low blood sugar. Okay. That, that's his only pertinent medical history. He has nothing in surgical history and his meds are just his insulin pump. That's it. Okay. Any, any questions that you guys would want to hear about like with his past medical history or anything that you guys want to know about like family or social? Um, is he a smoker? Any recent travel or exposures that are unusual in the last six months? Good questions. Yeah, he's a, a never tobacco smoker. He smokes marijuana occasionally. He says he drinks socially, which to him means like once or twice a week, week he has a couple of drinks and no other substance use. He has not traveled. Um, this all started like right before COVID started and he's been trying to quarantine himself at home. And was he born in the US or was he born elsewhere? He was born in the US. Yeah, that's actually a really good question too because one of the things that um, uh, when we talked about hemoptysis the other day and cavitary lesions, Dr. Connors pointed out that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of to uh, contract TB, you have to be pretty chronically exposed to it. And so just because you travel to uh, Southeast Asia or Mexico or one of these other countries that we typically think of being endemic to TB, it's more the people that are from these countries that we actually see um, uh, that actually contract TB more than people who just visit these um, visit the areas that are endemic. So I think that's a really great question, Dr. Chalkenham. Um, okay, perfect. I think that's a lot of good information. So if uh, if one of the um, if one of y'all don't mind um, uh, giving us a like a problem representation of this patient, a quick one liner, and then we'll make a differential on them. I can try. Um, oh, thank you. So this is a young male in his late 20s coming in with left-sided chest pain, um, cough, fever, and headaches with nausea and photophobia, developing confusion, um, concerning for like some sort of underlying infectious process. Um, and it's been like persistent over a couple months considering like for something like smoldering, subacute, atypical, um, and yeah, I think that's what I'd say. Past medical history of diabetes. Actually, that's great. I think you really kind of, um, I think you put all the relevant things in there. The only thing I would maybe like change a little bit is instead of saying kind of like a, a smoldering subacute at the end, I would probably put it like coming in with, um, subacute slash chronic left-sided chest pain and cough fevers and headache, uh, or at least chronic left-sided chest pain uh, fevers and cough, because that seems like it's been going on, I think, for probably at least uh, over two months. So I think I think he's probably met the criteria by now that we can say he's kind of moved to the chronicity has come become more chronic then. Um, cool. No, that's really good. So um, kind of with that really well done one-liner what uh let's go ahead and, before we get to the vitals physical and labs why don't we make a differential for him sure i mean we've kind of talked about like so infection um and you'd probably like lean towards the given the chronicity of it some things like uh like fungal or if he had a pneumonia with a non-resolving like pneumonic effusion or something like that that's concerning to his pleuritic pain, um, cough that's persisting for this time, things like that um, I'd throw on there. Um, I think also just maybe unifying too, but like, you know, and again, it's also having headaches in syndrome and it's a 29 year old and it's really concerning to abruptly get that, um, like malignancy would be something that I'd be worrying about, like a cancer with maybe an effusion that met it, something like that would be kind of high risk. I think it would be interesting to um, look for some more atypical infections too with his like immunocompromisation um, of type one diabetes. And then um, does he does he have either further autoimmune conditions or um, 
or another reason to to have something going on this long as a young person. Yeah, you guys, that's actually some really good points. I think you actually, um, Dr. Mandara, you you um, you actually brought up a uh, something we kind of we got kind of fixated on the cough and the fevers and the other thing to think about is um, these headaches. Um, I guess hearing those headaches. Are they concerning to you all at all, or do they, or does it sound like something that you wouldn't be too concerned about? I think. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think with the confusion that like makes me a little more concerned, um, like that paired with the photophobia and the vomiting, I feel like it all could point towards like something causing increased intracranial pressure and. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, so, think it's go ahead. I think it's a new onset and someone that's young that hasn't had a history of it. Like that's that makes it like alarming for me in particular um, and like not resolving the typical stuff. Although I know fear is that's awful for treatment of that stuff anyway, but um, that's just what made me kind of zone in on it. Yeah, to be honest, there's only one indication like I can think of off the top of my head that I know to get fewer set, and that's for um, headaches following LPs. And really, it's just the caffeine in there. <laughs> um, I know that you can use it for migraines, but or use it for headaches. But yeah, that's not one I, I typically grab for from grab grab for from my repertoire of uh, migraine medication. Um, well, this is actually really good. I, I kind of want to so just take a step back and. Um, because we're kind of on the, we've kind of switched gears a little bit from the uh, respiratory symptoms now going to the headache symptoms. And so what I wanted to do real quick is um, I'm going to switch the screen over to my screen and I want us to kind of work on doing a, working on like what your red flag, what do you guys, like first off, what symptoms y'all have that are concerning for elevated intracranial elevated intracranial pressure? Yeah. So we were kind of talking about headaches worse in the morning. Um, oftentimes are concerning associated yeah. nausea and vomiting, as people are mentioning. Yeah. Um, there's some physical exam findings. I don't know if you want to get into that, like papilledema which would go along with vision changes, which people are saying, but. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sorry, so let me give me one second. So I'm gonna write all this, all this down because that's really good information. So elevated ICP, Let's, so why don't we start with symptoms and I'm gonna put over here the red flag. And these kind of, really these kind of correlate with one another, um, but just for like the sake of, um, uh, kind of the sake of somebody coming in with um, really, yeah, they're just going to correlate. They correlate with one of those. So you guys, somebody already said, um, Jess, I think you were saying papilledema. What else were you saying? We said headaches worse in the morning or upon waking or waking them from sleep at night. Yeah. And then associated nausea and vomiting. So headaches worse in the morning, wake up, headaches wake you up. What else do you guys think about when you have like red flag symptoms that kind of correlate with this elevated intracranial pressure? Um, like a new seizure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's yeah. just, let, let's, somebody, I think somebody actually had written on their, um, somebody had written on their positional headaches, which I think is a really good point as well. So what did, what did that mean by positional headaches? If uh, whoever wrote that can kind of clarify. Uh, I don't actually know who came up with that. Yeah, it was it was, it was the VA team, and they might not be able to. Yeah, so pretty much uh, headaches seem to be worse than when you change positions. Typically, typically, I think of when you lie down, just because you're gonna have your uh, cerebral blood flow is actually gonna increase. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so usually uh, worse with sitting up or lying down. Okay. It's kind of yeah. not specific, but I think people can have um, vision changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So vision changes, anything, um, 
Yeah. And Cassandra actually put a great, she actually put a great point in um, what, um, and I think um, her, what she's alluding to more so than anything with uh, Cushing's triad. Um, does anybody want to kind of give a crack at it? Cassandra, you can, if you, if you have a, if you have a microphone, just explaining what you think about when you see Cushing's triad. Or I guess like what, what, and I see the symptom wise, but, or what, um, or what vital signs we see in uh, physical example, what are you worried about whenever you see that happening? What's impending? Yeah. So whenever we see a Cushing's triad, we have to be worried about somebody who's actually herniating. Um, so obviously these people are already going to be altered and they're uh, probably going to be comatose. And so if you're, um, if these people all of a sudden they develop severe hypertension, bradycardia, and then they also have respiratory depression, you should really consider that they are getting this Cushing's triad. And so, um, any any other big some any other kind of red flag symptoms for you guys where you would start um, uh, would where you would want to say like be more concerned about these headaches? I think we kind of been like projectile vomiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an altered mental status. I think we said that already too. But... Yeah. Good. Now I'm going to, I'm going to throw one out at you guys. I want you all to think about what can kind of mimic a migraine that's a rheumatologic disease. Cause you guys know I want to do, I'm, I'm big in a room, but what's something that can mimic a, um, yeah, who somebody, oh, perfect. T-Max already beat me to it. So what are you guys thinking about when you have jaw claudication and temporal pain? <laughs> Giant cell arteritis. Yeah, and why is why is what is like the complication you worry about most in giant cell arteritis? Why we want to like keep that in the back burner um, for somebody who's older with coming in with a new headache? Blindness. Yeah. yeah, vision loss. So that's kind of the thing we always worry about. And once you get vision loss, it's not. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm almost positive that you actually it's not um, reversible. So once you lose vision. <laughs> And actually, that is another, that actually is, uh, so, I, know this, I know this is Dr. Traffic who's hopped on my name right now and just trying to drag me through the mud and make me look real. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's actually another good point. Anything that increases your, any headaches that occur after like increased intrathoracic pressure, like Valsava, um, if you have exertional headaches, all those, um, that is also concerning for some kind of, uh, intracranial process that's causing this. And then the only other one I was going to say was new headaches after age 50 is what I, I put on there too. Um, one of the things that when I was looking up, that was one of the other concerning symptoms. So um, anybody that's coming in with a new headache after 50 and no history of migraines previously, that's also a concerning symptom. So you also um, need to have a higher suspicion for something else going on. I think that's a really good list. Uh, I think we really hit all the high parts. So when you, hey, when Corey. you get, yeah, sorry, this is Anita. Um, with giant cell though, that's usually something you would see after age like 60, right? It's like pretty rare. Under, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So actually people that are going to be, it's uh, older than 50 is typically what we look for. Okay. So if, if, if there's anybody under 50 that has um, anybody that's under 50, you're worried about giant cell arteritis, you have the wrong differential on there. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Good point. Very good point. Okay. Any other like big points anybody wants to bring up right now? Okay. So why don't we like go ahead and switch it back over to Dr. Gergen and I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. So, um, so right now, uh, our differential, we got infection and malignancy. Um, anything else anybody wants to add on there? Or? We were talking What were y'all saying? I think somebody else just said vasculitis, which um, was along the lines of thought that we had in terms of rheumatologic type things. So vasculitis and even the ones that we always put on the differential, like sarcoid, lupus, but with the pulmonary and neurologic, um, I think those are reasonable to consider. Um, and then other infection things we kind of talked about, we didn't go over risk factors for HIV, but just thinking about if that could be possible and that would increase, that would lengthen our differential for infectious things. 
Very good. Yeah, those are actually really good points. HA, if this person, a young gentleman, uh, coming in with symptoms concerning for an underlying infection, it's odd for somebody young to get this. And so I think always, if anybody has any kind of infectious process that is uh, pretty systemic and no clear ideology, no clear reason for them, I would always keep HIV in the back burner. I think you should always keep that in a young person who's coming in with some kind of new infection. And the vasculitis, yeah. I mean, these vasculitides, people coming in with fatigue um, can be nonspecific symptoms. They're CNS vasculitis. Um, and I think thinking sarcoid, trying to link, doing a, uh, Occam's razor and trying to connect cerebral and pulmonary. I, I appreciate that. Dr. Gergen will attest to that. I'm all about that. So I think thinking of odd things too, but really, uh, really good points. So just for the sake of time, why don't we get mo keep going? So uh, Dr. King, do you mind giving us the vitals for the patient and then the physical exam? Sure. So initial temperature is 36.8, heart rate of 59, blood pressure 119 over 58. Respiratory rate 18, and his O2 set was 96% on room air. Okay. And what about what about his physical exam? Sure. So um, in general, he um, seems alert and oriented to you. He's answering questions appropriately. Um, his girlfriend is at bedside though, and is commenting that he his his answers seem off and like he's not himself. He doesn't necessarily appreciate that though. Um, HE and T exam, his pupils are um, equally round and reactive to light. Um, I'll go into neuro there too. So on gross visual field testing, he has like a very apparent left-sided visual field defect. He's got some mild left facial droop, but otherwise cranial nerves seem unremarkable. He also has some asymmetric strength um, decrease on the left as compared to the right. For example, in his upper extremities, um, elbow flexion seems four out of five on the left, whereas it's five out of five on the right. And similar in terms of um, strength of knee extension on left versus right. Um, cards wise, his heart's regular rate and rhythm. His breast lungs are actually clear bilaterally. He's got no wheezes, he's got no rails. You look on his chest wall um, and he points to like his left lateral chest wall to where the pain is and there's no appreciable skin changes. It's non-tender to palpation. Okay, good, really good. That's a good physical exam. Um, so before we kind of talk about, talk about the physical exam, <laughs> Dr. Treffle like still, uh, still hounded me back there. Um, why don't, do you mind, I know we're going to want to get just the basic uh, ER handshake labs of a CBC and BMP. Are there any other labs that you guys want to, uh, want to get as well? Yeah, good points on systems. It sounds like I want to see two labs. Yeah. That's not a lab. You guys yeah. go to CBC. Okay. Um, any, and then um, why don't we just get those labs and then we'll go over imaging and any other, um, anything else you guys might want. So, same you um, got. Yeah. So, CBC, his white count is 13. Hemoglobin's also 13. Hematocrit of 39.9. Platelets are 525. Um, on the diff on that Y county, it's got 10.93 absolute neutrophils, which is slightly high. And then his BMP, sodium's 130, potassium's four, chloride 100, bicarb 20, BUN 20, creatinine one, glucose is 206, and calcium's 9.3. And then LFTs, total protein is 7.3, albumin is 2.7, Billy is 0.3, AST is 12, ALT is 8, ALKFOS is 109. Okay. And then can I add one additional bit of history before we talk about imaging? Yeah. 
Um, so after you're walking out of the room for after your physical exam with this patient in the emergency room, the nurse calls you back in because she thinks that he's seizing. Okay. Okay. Any of our participants, anybody have any questions or anything right now? I just want to know why she, like, what is she seeing that makes her worried that he's seizing? And if we yeah. can scan. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, he um, went unresponsive. His whole body seemed kind of rigid. Looks sort of like generalized convulsions. It lasted about 30 seconds um, and then stopped. Does he have to be post ictal at all? Yeah, he's appreciably confused now. Yeah, good questions. Why, why do you guys ask that if, uh, if, if I can uh, push you guys on so we can understand that? Um, for the post ictal, I feel like there's a lot of things that can cause someone like to syncopize and be like confused, like, or, and have rhythmic movements associated with it. And I feel like whether or not there are post ictal can be a little helpful. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I think that's a really good point. To be honest, like, so you can, um, so if somebody, um, if somebody has a vasovagal response, um, especially they can actually have like what looks like tonic clonic, tonic clonic movements. And in, in reality, it's just jerky motions. It's probably from like hypercapnia or something like that. Um, and so the post state is actually a really good differentiating factor, knowing if these movements were like truly post, if this person was truly having a seizure or if this was something else that it could have mimicked a seizure. It's a really good, really good questions. And, um, uh, Jessica, Jess clarifying like what the movements look like as well is very important too, or if this could have been like an abson seizure, any of those other things. So understanding what they actually look like when they were having this seizure is incredibly important too. So, so right now you've got this guy, you did your physical, you got your labs, um, and we can, we'll just skip over like talking about the labs, but what do you guys want to do right now? I think I'd like to go to imaging. Okay. So what kind of imaging do you want to get for him? <laughs> I mean, at least you'd start with the chest x-ray, but I want a CT head and CT chest probably. <laughs> Perfect. So chest x-ray, CT head. Um, looks like somebody is wanting to get a, a HIV on there as well. Yeah, all that stuff's fine too. It looks like somebody wants a CT collarbone, if we can get that as well, Dr. King. <laughs> Didn't get that, sorry. So there's a chest X-ray, and if somebody doesn't mind, just giving a quick, uh, quick read of that. Uh, chest X-ray, largely clear parenchyma on the right side, no infiltrate suffusions on the left. You have a pretty pronounced attached to the pleura. Um, large opacity is left, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that I don't see, like, it doesn't look like obviously necrotic or anything, but a large, dense lesion, plural attached. Yeah. And I, it's kind of hard to tell if it's, I, I think saying it's a, I think a large, um, uh, large yeah, yeah. opacity is probably like the easiest thing, but I think it's, I think as far peripheral as it is, I don't think it's unfair to think like that. But um, so I think we've got a lateral chest X-ray. So why don't we flip to that? Okay. okay. So any changes in that read or? I think it was pretty good. I think yeah. you. No, I think that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think you covered everything pretty well. So it looks like he's got some kind of round pretty circumferential opacity like in the per peripheral lung fields it's pretty prominent, definitely in the posterior aspect so um so i think the next image that we got um because you were down you were down there and you wanted the ct somebody wanted the ct chest so why don't we go ahead and see what the ct chest looks like and then we'll get to the ct so does anybody want to tell me what they See right there. It's 
So it's hard because we're only seeing it at one level, um, but it does look like, I think I see pleura on the outside of whatever that is. So um, like, I feel like if that had pleura on the inside, it would almost look like a pleural effusion, but the pleura on the outside, it's like hard with that consistency. It could be like fat or like pus. It looks really like homogenous though. Um, no, I agree. Is this is kind of, I, I don't have the skills to say if this is actually like within the pleural cavity or not. Um, but I think it's safe to say he's got some kind of left, left, um, left mass. And it looks, it's kind of hard for me to tell which lobe it is. Cause uh, like you said, it's, we don't have all the cuts of it, but I think it's safe to say that he does have some left mass. Why don't we see what uh, Dr. King, do you mind telling us what the, do you remember what the read for this was? Yeah, so sorry, this was at not one of our typical hospitals, so I didn't have the full images, just these clips, but if you scroll, it looks more or less the same and it kind of stays within the major fissure on the left. It's read as a collection of pleural fluid. Um, and what you guys mentioned, the density looks not like simple fluid, possibly like blood or like pus, looks proteinaceous. Okay, very cool. All right, so, so we got the chest x-ray, we've got the um, CT chest. Um, the, our gentleman had a seizure, so I assume you guys want the CT head pretty um, ASAP, is that right? Okay. Let's see what the CT head shows. Oh no. Um, so anybody, anybody who feels at all comfortable about telling us what they see on this imaging? It looks like, right? Like the lesions kind of like in that spot that you'd expect for where his visual field deficits are with his like left, like it's right based lesions, like occipital. Yeah. Um, he had that left visual, uh, those left field deficits. I mean, so this is a rimmed lesion with it looks like a necrotic type center. Um, and there's multiple of them throughout that you can see three. Yeah. There's also maybe some mass effect on the ventricles. I guess it's hard to say without scrolling, but there might be mass effect. I agree. It looks like it, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think that it totally looks like there's mass effect. That, um, so that right-sided ventricle looks like it's pretty squished compared to that left side on the same cut. So um, even, even if you look at the, um, the coronal view, it looks like he actually is, um, you can see at least a little bit of the ventricle, but it looks like it's pretty, um, pretty squished right there as well. So, um, so I kind of wanted to, so, um, Dr. Mandar, like you actually mentioned a really good, uh, a really good point about this, uh, what these masses look like, a characteristic of ring enhancing. So what, what does, what kind of, that buzzword, what does that kind of like reflect to you usually? Yeah, I mean like, uh, it's not located in the place and there's multiple of them, but like, you know, if it's centrally located and has that classic butterfly, like you'd think of like GBM as a classic necrotizing mass for cancer. Um, yeah. other like, you know, with, uh, to form like that ne necrotic center and a rim-based lesion, you think of like cavitary lesions, infectious stuff going on, toxo um, being a big one. But yeah, I mean, a lot of fungal infections can look like that too. They might be too big, but don't Mets look like that sometimes and, too? Uh, Mets, yeah. I mean, I would imagine that like, like more like similarly like density right. type lesion, I thought mm -hmm. would for Mets, but for sure. Yeah, and actually, you got you got some you you pretty much you hit a lot of the ones that um, I also had on my differential for a, a ring enhancing lesion, but UCH residents also can also give you a hand with there as well. So they said brain abscess, CNS lymphoma, toxo. Um, you said GBM, which is actually apparently like when it's a primary single lesion that actually is one you should really consider. And like you said, usually crossing the midline showed what you were talking about in a necrotic center, and that uh, Mets actually can cause it as well. Um, uh, is there any, so if you saw this, are there any particular malignancies that kind of jump out at you? Um, sarcoid, yeah, that's, I'm not sure about sarcoid, but that's a good point. Yeah, CNS lymphomas, like I, I think mentioned, like that'd be the big one. Yeah, what, what, uh, what other meta, what metastatic diseases do you guys, do you typically? Like, you would worry about like lung cancer, right? Like lung going to the brain? Yeah, and usually like the other thing to always think about like is like melanoma. Melanoma is a big one. Melanoma like that's the brain uh, pretty frequently, and it's actually yeah, um, 
uh, colon and renal and Corey, Corey carcinoma. If this was a female, would be the other one to think about, but obviously that's not the case for us. So, so I guess, so now we've got the head imaging, we've got, um, uh, imaging of his chest. Uh, is there any other workup that you guys want right now? You can go to any procedure. Get an HIV test back. Good, that's great. Really good point, Dr. King. Did they get it? HIV was sent and it was negative. I think I would be worried about um, doing a lumbar puncture in someone that that has possible mass effect. But if we could get like cytology on that, that could potentially be easier than accessing the pleural fluid. Or we could do a a CT biopsy, CT guided biopsy of the pleural fluid or something. I want to see some cells. Yeah, I agree. Tissue is the issue. And so the best answer that you guys are going to get are going to go for want to get tissue. So if you have to pick between choosing right now to sample the brain or the lungs, what are you going to choose to do? Probably the lung. I mean, it looks like it'd be easy, fairly straightforward for them to access that. Yeah, I feel like IR could do that pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the other, um, yeah, and we'll, we'll get back to this in a second, but so it looks like probably want to do, um, want to sample the lung. So, uh, so uh, Dr. King, did you guys by chance get pleural fluids on or yeah, pleural fluids from this gentleman? We did. So um, bedside ultrasound revealed a fluid pocket that was a little over two centimeters deep, but it wasn't very wide. It's just like small and irregular, not really free flowing pleural fluid as you can appreciate on that chest x-ray. Yeah. So we did go to IR to have this done under imaging guidance. Um, they aspirated Frank Puss, so they converted to a pigtail chest tube placement, which I think the next chest x-ray shows. Um, it was sent for studies, but unfortunately, both samples clotted and um, they couldn't run anything. Except they did run uh, Graham Sandin culture. Very good, very good. So why don't we? Um, I'm going to get Dr. Gergen to uh, switch over, and I just want you guys to uh, just kind of go over some plural plural fluid studies real quick, and just kind of because um, this is one thing you're going to be encounter. So whenever you guys. Um, when you see somebody who's got a pleural infusion and you worry about an infectious etiology, what are um, what are the kind of, what type of um, I guess what are the two big classes of pleural fluid? Like, um, yeah, transudate. Transudate, yeah. Why don't we do that? So let's start pleural fluid, and then transudate. Right, and then what are you guys? What are you guys going to use to uh, differentiate between the two? Life's criteria. Yeah, and so what? What goes into that exactly? And what? Mm -hmm. What are the values that you think about with? Why don't we just say what makes a? What with Life's criteria makes exudative effusion? Yeah, it's like your LDH and protein relative from the plural to the relative to your serum. Hopefully, you heard that. <laughs> LDH and protein from the plural studies relative to the. Um, yeah, and what uh, what what exact exact values from LDH kind of lead you to an exudative effusion? I think it's Greater bigger than fifty percent. Right? Two thirds upper limit or normal. I think. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Or um, or fluid uh, fluid over serum greater than 0. 0.6. And what's the other one? Protein fluid over serum greater than 0. 0.5. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, Dr. King, did he have a uh, did he have a exudative or transudative effusion? Um, it was Frank Puss, so presumed exudative. Yeah, yeah. But all of Frank. those we couldn't actually run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. That's fair. All right, so then we get to an exudative effusion. We think this is infectious, and this is just purely from an infectious and exudative effusion. And so, um, when you see, when you hear Frank Puss, what does that automatically mean? This fluid is bacteria, like empyema. Like yeah, yeah. So Frank Puss is going means it's empyema. 
And then to differentiate between the other two of like an infectious exudative process, you're either going to have a paraneumonic effusion. It's either going to be complicated or uncomplicated. And pretty much the two differentiating factors if are complicated and uncomplicated. Surprise is that if, it, if it's infected or not infected, do you know what, um, what makes it infected versus not infected? I think it's just gram staining, right? Positive. There's that, and then there's two values we look at. I mean, cell count, like the cell, count. cell count's a good one. It, um, and pH. Yeah, so it's pH less than 7.2 and glucose less than 40. Dr. Gergen, am I missing anything there? That's a complicated. Um, all right, so why is it important to differentiate between a complicated and a uncomplicated paraneumonic effusion? You want to know if you have to put a chest tube in versus not having to put a chest tube in? Yeah, exactly. So these two are going to need a chest tube placed, which will be in there until like it actually like a per up to date actually says you're going to keep a chest tube in place until like they're less than 100 cc's of fluid. So this guy, he's got an empyema. So um, this is obviously um, uh, he's obviously going to have a chest tube placed. And so I th think uh, we'll go back to the case, but um, those are kind of the big the really big three I wanted to kind of get over, uh, get to about um, kind of an infectious plural plural effusion. So uh, Dr. King, we'll go back to Dr. Gergen and see what uh, all was done. So Dr. King, looks like y'all drain the fluid and you get placed a, city placed a chest tube. Um, is there anything else you guys want to do for this gentleman who's got these severe headaches? confusion and seizures i probably need to you know get neurosurgery here and start on some kepra <laughs> fair what is what it so when you see somebody who's got um who's got a mass lesion and they are symptomatic from them they're symptomatic <laughs> huh steroids yeah what are you going to give them some decks what's a deck Q, I don't even know what it yeah, is. Q4 maybe like loading dose of like, yeah. yeah. Something like a 10 Q4 is my guess. I don't know. That's something guess. like that. So you actually, you, you guys are on the right track. So you get one dose of IV Dex 10, and then you do four Q6 following that. So, um, yeah, so it, that's another big teaching point here is somebody comes in with symptomatic, elevated intracranial pressure, um, uh, uh, elevated intracranial pressure, they're symptomatic, they have a seizure. Um, I, I see what they're saying about infection and steroids, but even so, um, I, what, I was, what I could see online, it looks like you still give these people DEGS because of the symptomatic elevated intracranial pressure. I don't know, Dr. King, what did, uh, what did you all end up doing for this gentleman? Yeah, so we did exactly that. We called neurosurgery um, as soon as we got that CT back. They um, started him on Dr. Dron. He actually got six Q6. Um, I don't know why the higher dose, to be honest. And then um, he was loaded with Kepra in the ED and then started on uh, Kepra 500 BID, I believe, uh, for ongoing seizure prophylaxis. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I actually, to be honest, I think the reason they, I think if you do the math, it's all, I think you're supposed to just give them 24 milligrams of DEX and it's whichever way you want to slice it is the, uh, is the way to do it. And um, uh, good question. So doing mannitol on this gentleman, do you think you should give him mannitol? I don't know. Yeah, this is kind of tough. And, you know, mannitol is one that um, even with like elevated intracranial pressures, it still is not. Um, it, I mean, obviously, if somebody's usually the only time I've ever seen like the discussion of mannitol or hypertonic saline is as if somebody's actually like about to herniate or we're concerned like they're getting Cushing's triad. Uh, in the the first thing I uh, the first thing I would uh, do in this gentleman is treat him with dec decadron and see if he 
uh, symptomatically gets better. The question, I guess, is like, what if this guy has another seizure? He's on Decatron, he's on antiepileptics. What do you do? Do you I, paralyze I, them? Huh? Do you paralyze them? Or is that also for herniation? Yeah, no, I mean, it's hard, right? Like that's, I, this is kind of where it kind of gets out of our scope and probably neurosurgery is going to be the one who's going to be driving the boat on this. Um, but yeah, somebody's talking about, yeah, you can hyperventilate these individual, individuals too if you're worried about herniation. But um, yeah, so so why don't we just to kind of wrap up this case, um, Dr. King, what, uh, so you got neurosurgery involved, got Keppra, got Dex. Did y'all do anything with these brain apses? And yeah, we did. And I see antibiotics too. Yes, he got started on uh, Vank and Zosin and initially in the ED. Okay. Um, so neurosurgery took him for craniotomy, the next okay. step. Um, they wanted uh, about 12 to 24 hours to get steroids on board prior to that. So he had these, um, it was actually two abscesses. The, the one coronal cut on that head CT was actually just another angle of the, the second larger abscess. Um, what they said was you have to aspirate the fluid out, but you actually also have to like excise the fibrinous layer that surrounds the abscess. Otherwise, even if you go in and drain that fluid, the fluid's pretty likely to recur. So he had an excision of two brain abscesses. His pleural fluid and his brain abscesses um, initially resulted as many gram positive cocci. He did not get mannitol up front, but post-op neurosurgery asked for him to get mannitol, just presuming that his um, cerebral inflammation and edema would be worse for the first couple of days post-op. Nice. Interesting. Okay. So um, in the little bit of reading, I actually did look into, um, look into this. Um, yeah, they actually did talk about, it was kind of interesting. So they talked about, you know, brain abscesses, at least per up to date, wasn't saying that you necessarily have to drain these, drain abscesses, drain abscesses. But the reason that he probably did is because he had a seizure, he was symptomatic. And so he was probably having enough mass effect that they needed to drain these anyways. Um, either way, this is where we kind of defer to neurosurgery. If that's what they do at what their hospital, I would just defer to whatever their management is. But yeah, so... Dr. Dr. King, what um, what bacteria did they end up growing? Yeah, so cultures all resulted as Streptococcus intermedius, which is um, one of the beer and Streptococci group. Nice. So very interesting. So pretty much this gentleman had uh, had a uh, empyema and a um, empyema and a empyema and a uh, um, brain abscesses from uh, from strep viridin. So team at, VA from Team X actually had a good question. Did you guys get a TTE on this gentleman? He did get a TTE, which did not show vegetation, um, and he never had positive blood cultures. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So where did, uh, where did they think uh, he actually ended up getting the uh, bacteria from. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a very good question. And UC Tresens is asking a lot of great questions. Um, he had nothing notable on dental exam uh, that was performed, and he um, has no dental pain either. ID's best guess was that he aspirated um, viridin streptococci or oral flora. And so oftentimes the people get a, a strep intermedius empyema, it's from an aspiration pneumonia, though the, the location is strange, right? It's left-sided, um, it's not quite posterior, it's not where you would expect it to be. Um, and extensive review of substance use or anything else that would put them at risk to aspirate, that was all negative. So maybe at some point four months ago he aspirated, but it's also really unusual, as UCH residents pointed out, that he didn't get sicker if he truly had uncontrolled pleural infection for months. Um, but then on further review of records, so it was actually, it was Denver Health he was seen at four months prior to this. And he had like the smallest appreciable pleural effusion at that time. Um, and a bedside ultrasound report says fluid collection consisted with pneumonia, which was a little bit of a confusing read and he got PO antibiotics then. And his PCP outside facility had actually gotten a chest CT in the interim, which also showed empyema essentially, and he got oral antibiotics again for that. 
Um, so he had had oral antibiotics and no drainage multiple times, presumably for what was it, in fact an empyema. Interesting. So I guess this is, there's actually a good teaching point from here too is, because um, you guys will definitely see this a pretty frequent amount. Um, if you have, uh, and I'll let uh, Dr. King chime in since she's a budding pulmonologist, but uh, people who come in that actually have a strep pneumonia, 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 uh, one of the complications you need to worry about in these people is a uh, parapneumonic effusion that they can get. And so classically, it's like three days later, you'll have them like complaining about new chest pain on whatever side the pneumonia is on. And what you should do at that point is get an uh, X an x-ray to um, make sure they do not have a new effusion there that is concerning for a parapneumonic effusion that you might have to tap to make sure it's not infected. I mean, I think the, the other possibility with him is, is that he could have very well, like, he had his pneumonia, he got a parapneumonic effusion, it was untreated, developed in pyema, and then he got septic. He uh, uh, sounded like possibly got septic and then uh, through some infection spread through his brain, but... Yeah. Any other, Dr. King, any other teaching points or any critique on anything I just said about? No, I think that was great. I think main takeaways were empyemas need to be drained or anytime you are concerned you have infection in the pleural space. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, he got this empyema and then hematogenously seeded his brain. And so multiple rim enhancing brain lesions should be concerning for abscess from hematogenous spread. Yeah. Well, from any, any other questions that any of our other participants had right now? I don't know, I think we're good here. Okay, so um, just to kind of like, kind of bring, uh, kind of round out everything we talked about, if each one of our uh, main participants don't mind telling us one new teaching point that they got, or one new thing they learned about from today, I would really appreciate it. When I'm a PCP, I will make sure to send my patients in for an kindness. Um. You got anything? <laughs> I think having like a lower threshold to think about like increased ICP and like what the red flag symptoms are for that. 